looking to, who's our role model. God has saved us through Jesus to make a difference. We're going to have our Bible readings. Um, so if all those that are going to be doing a little reading, if you'd like to come forward, that would be great. Thank you. So you might not want to turn up all of these. The first one is, the, is slightly longer, so it's John chapter 5. I'm going to have all the words on the screen. If you want to look up John 5, that's fine. The others are shorter, um, which will follow in a moment. John 5, 16. So because Jesus was doing these things on the Sabbath, the Jews persecuted him. Jesus said to them, My father is always at his work to this very day, and I too am working. For this reason, the Jews tried all the harder to kill him. Not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. Jesus gave them this answer. I tell you the truth, the son can do nothing by himself. He can only do what he sees his father doing, because whenever the father does, not, does the son also does. For the father loves the son and shows him all he does. Yes, to your amazement, he will show him even greater things than these. For just as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, even so the Son gives life to whom he is pleased to give it. Moreover, the Father judges no one, but is entrusted all judgment to the Son, that all may honour the Son just as they honour the Father. He who does not, does not honour the Son does not honour the Father who sent him. I tell you the truth, whoever hears my words and believes them, who sent me has eternal life and will not be condemned. He has crossed over from death to life. I tell you the truth, a time is coming and has now come when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. For as the Father has life in him, so he has granted the Son to have life in himself. And he has given him authority to judge because he is the Son of Man. Do not be amazed at this, for a time is coming when all who are in their graves will hear his voice and come out. Those who have done good will rise to live, and those who have done evil will rise to be condemned. By myself I can do nothing. I judge only as I hear, and my judgment is just, for I seek not to please myself, but him who sent me. Thank you. So that's the words of Jesus talking about his relationship with the Father as the eternal Son. Now uh, we're going to have a few shorter readings to think about what it means for us to, to follow God as his children. So Ephesians chapter 5, verses 1 to 2 says, Follow God's example, therefore, as dearly loved children, and live a life of love just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Sarah, Matthew chapter 5. Thank you. Matthew 5.14 You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Thank you. Amen. Ken. Matthew 5, verse 43. You've heard it said that love your neighbour and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your Father in heaven. He causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your own people, what are you doing more than others? Do not even the pagans do that? Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Thank you. And then Chris, 1 Peter 1. <clears throat> therefore, with minds that are fully alert and sober, set your hope on the grace to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed at his coming. As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. But just as he who called you 
is holy, so be holy in all you do, for it is written, be holy because I am holy. Thank you. Let's pray. Let's ask God to help us as we think this through. Father, thank you that you are good. You have all that we need. Thank you that through Jesus we are yours, your children, and you are changing us, you're transforming us to be more like you. And so we pray that as we listen now and as we take in the things that you're prompting us to respond to by faith, that we would truly grow and grow into the likeness of Christ and be the people that you've called us to be. So we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. So um, worksheets as normal, you've got those um, just to follow along if you want to jot anything down, if that's helpful to you. Um, questions are there for midweek, for when we get to, to our midweek groups as well this week uh, for us to, to, get to work through together. So as we come on to this subject of copying our Heavenly Father, let's start at this place. Parents are the major influence on their children I was uh, reading a little story uh, just a few weeks ago about, it happened to be a mum, and she was, she was talking about how she used to think that she was a, a very calm and patient and considerate driver. <laughs> Until one day, as she was driving along, and she suddenly heard her three-year-old shout out the window, You idiot! <laughs> she felt convicted and condemned. Her child had picked up on the way that she treated other drivers in a way that she'd never really seen before. Oh no. She recognized, suddenly she recognized that she was a, a judgmental driver, <laughs> judging everybody else's actions. Um, none of those here, of course. I can see that from the smiles. Yeah, that's right. Um, but she also realized that in, from that experience, that Actually, in lots of areas of life, she was judgmental on the people that she came across. She was making snap decisions about people based on their appearance or their abilities or the ways that their actions impacted her. She was making some very, very clear assumptions. And so you think in different situations, she would judge the, the, the coffee barrister as slow. She would judge the... The, uh, the, the, the checkout person at the supermarket is too talkative or the bus driver is too grumpy. She made, these, made certain assumptions about people and then judged them without knowing anything about their background. And it wasn't until her own child shouted something on that occasion that it made her wake up to herself and start questioning who she was and what she was doing. And so she repented. And what she wanted to do to, to, to try and make a change within her family situation and the influence upon her children, she invented a game. She invented a game called the maybe game, which her, which, which her and her children were then going to play out. And the aim of the game was basically to pause between seeing a behavior and reacting to it. The reason for that, it gave the opportunity to stop and think before passing judgment. So that was the aim of the game, and the one rule of the game was very simple. To come up with a reason, and one that is as kind as possible for the potential behaviour, the reason behind the, the behaviour of the people that they had just encountered. So, for example, when a small red car pulled out on them um, at a junction one time, uh, this is some of the things, some of the maybes that they came up with. Uh, one of her children... Uh, said, maybe there are a whole box of wine glasses on the way to a wedding that are precariously balanced. And so that person is being very careful not to go too quickly. Or maybe um, they're going very slowly because the person in the car, has broke, someone has broken their leg and they don't want to go too quickly and jolt and jar the leg and make it worse. Or the three-year-old in the car, think about the difference between shouting idiot and this one, said, maybe... Someone in the car is transporting an open bowl of jelly. And they don't want to spill the jelly on the way to wherever they're going. Can you see how even doing that, even the plan, that little game changed, changed the way that they saw people. With every suggestion that they made, their compassion and their humour rose. You see the difference? 
They were still dro driving very slowly behind the red car, and they still really wanted to get to where they were going quicker than they were, but the way they handled it was very different. They found some grace in that situation. And that game, that, that lady was explaining how that game became their default way of responding to, to situations and circumstances that they faced to counter being judgmental or reactive. So maybe, maybe the coffee barista is very talkative because they're lonely. And so when they go to work, it's their way of connecting with people. Maybe the checkout person um, is, uh, is slow because they've, they've hurt their back or they've got a cold. Maybe the bus driver is a bit grumpy because they've heard bad news or as the three-year-old came up with, maybe he just needs the toilet. Whatever it is, the reasons or the different things that they came up with could be serious, they could be silly, they could be realistic or they could be ridiculous. But the whole point is that the result in their own hearts was compassion for those people that they came across. Can you see the influence, the lady, what she was trying to do and the influence she was trying to have on those around her, on her children? It changed. And it makes us ask a couple of questions, really, that story. The first question I think it, it makes us ask is this. What values are we influencing our children or those close to us with? What sort of influence are we being on other people around us? What are the positive influences that we have? But also, maybe, what are some of the unhelpful or negative influences? And have you become aware of any blind spots in your life? Maybe... You've just realized it yourself. Or maybe someone has had to point out something to you that you didn't see before. I wonder how you take that. It can be painful, can't it? It's hard to see that. But the reality is how we come across that we don't always realize. Of course, children pick up their major values about life, no surprise, from their parents. Including spiritual values as well. And the really key thing to this is, it's not just about what we say, it's about what we do, because children aren't silly, are they? They see whether our lives connect or, or not, or if we're being a bit hypocritical. But most people aren't silly either. You know, as we get to know each other, we'll, we'll see the real us. And so what are the values that we are emitting? What are the ways that we're influencing others? How do we come across? But of course, what underpins that, of course, is where are we getting our own influences from? Who are we looking to? Where are we looking to? What are the things that are making that impact on our own lives that then play out for others to see? Are we consciously or unconsciously picking up values from positive or negative role models, I wonder? And what sort of influence, if you're a believer, if you're a Christian, what sort of influence is God the Father having upon your life right now? How does your life reflect the one who is the dad in your household? The heavenly Father who knows you, loves you, and wants the best for you. How might your time with him, or how might you shape your time so that you're spending the time with him so that he can influence you in the way that means you become more and more like him? You know, that song by Lecrae, I don't know if it's your style or not. I realize that, you know, you've got to look at the words and try and pick up what's going on there. But it's very clear, the video, isn't it? That guy was talking about a time where he looked at any father figure, any role model. His own dad had let him down, obviously. And he was looking for influences, people that would accept him. And he fell in with the wrong people, didn't he? Lived the wrong life. And it wasn't until Jesus broke in, Jesus broke into his life, that things started to change. He realized that he had a father now, a heavenly father, God himself, who loved him, who knew him, who made him, who had the very best for him. And so his life began to be transformed. Isn't that our prayer for each of us? That we become more like our heavenly father as Jesus makes that difference to us. The writer J.I. Packer said in his book, Knowing God, he said, you sum up the whole of the New Testament if you describe it as the knowledge of God as one's holy father. Have you ever stopped to think that? That's what the New Testament's all about. As we come to know Jesus, God becomes our father, and that is the life that we are to live as a child of God. So if that's true, then it's really important for us to discover how we become children of God 
but then also how we live as children of God and how the Father can shape us in our lives. That's why we've taken time over this series. We haven't rushed it. So important for us to take our time and to realize these key things about how our Father made us and shaped us for his glory. How by grace, our Father forgives us and welcomes his children home. How Jesus, our Savior, is the only way to the Father. It's, he's an inclusive God with an exclusive message. But the ones who are in Christ, our Father loves us. This is the one that blew my mind away more than any other. Our Father loves us as much as he loves his eternal Son, Jesus. The Bible tells us. The Holy Spirit living in us confirms our adoption by the Father, gives us security forever. Our Father is more faithful than any earthly parent. Good experiences or negative experiences of earthly parents, God our Father tops the lot. And so if he is our lover of our soul, then he's our provider. He provides for his children, so don't worry. Your Father knows what you need. And then last week, I was grateful to Chris. I've listened back to Chris's talk and I found it very helpful that our Father disciplines us in love to share in his holiness. It's been fantastic over these last couple of months to, to hear from people here uh, uh, about how God has been working in, in our lives, how he's been growing us as his children, how he's been revealing more of himself as Father, the transformation that he's making been talking with quite a few people about that and seen that in our groups midweek as well as we've been talking and praying together. So praise God that transformation is happening. And I look forward to next week. You know, do consider and pray about whether you'd like to share something to encourage the church um, about how he's been working in your life. So we can see, can't we, here that parents are the major influence on their children. But let's come now specifically to Jesus, the perfect son of the perfect father and see the way that they related to each other. In, in our um, readings that we just had just now, Julia, she read uh, John chapter 5. Listen to these words that Jesus said in verse 19. Jesus said, Very truly I tell you, the son can do nothing by himself. He can do only what he sees the father doing because wherever the father does, the son also does. Jesus epitomized that phrase, like father, like son. Perfectly obeyed, perfectly followed. Remember Jesus explicitly, it was later on in John's Gospel, but we focused on it in this series, explicitly told the disciples that seeing him in action means that we can see God the Father. God reveals himself through Jesus. The invisible God is made visible through the person and the words and the actions and the life of Jesus Christ. He wanted us to see what God is truly like as he lived amongst people and he acted. And Jesus knew and held on to his identity as the Son of God. Remember how the enemy tried to knock him off course by the, the, either the subtle temptations or the direct attacks on his identity and the way he should live that out. But, but Jesus knew who he was. He knew who he was. And he perfectly trusted, he perfectly honoured, he perfectly obeyed his Father. So listen again as we, as we look at some of those verses from that John chapter 5 passage about how Jesus described his relationship with the Father. Verse 20, Jesus said, For the Father loves the Son and shows him all that he does. Verse 21, For just as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, even so, the Son gives life to whom he is pleased to give it. Verse 22 and 23, the Father has entrusted all judgment to the Son so that all may honour the Son just as they honour the Father. Verse 26, for as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son also to have life in himself. And verse 30, Jesus said, by myself, I can do nothing. I judge only as I hear, and my judgment is just. For I seek not to please myself, but him who sent me. So what incredible love the God the Father and God the Son shared and share now. What incredible love that they had between them that created this unity of purpose that flowed out from everything then that Jesus did. 
In everything he did, he wanted to honour the Father because he knew that the Father had the very best and that they were working together for the good of the world and God's people. It's what led Jesus to the cross. Praise God that Jesus went to the cross, that God's plan of salvation for us and to offer out to the world could be fulfilled, that life could be experienced in his name, that forgiveness for sin could be possible because Jesus died in our place. Remember Jesus, we've mentioned it, I mentioned it a few times through this series, how Jesus in Gethsemane, Jesus was fully man. He is fully man, right? You can't say that just because he was, he was God the Son that um, he didn't, uh, wasn't affected by the experiences of the world. No, Jesus experienced all the temptations, all different temptations that we face and all the hardships of the world. He was the man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. And Jesus, in the Garden of Gethsemane, cried out to the Father, didn't he? He knew what he was um, experiencing, he knew what he was carrying the weight of, and he said, Father, if you can take this cup away from me, please do. But he knew he had to go to the cross, and he said, no. For the sake of the world, not my will be done, but yours. Jesus didn't live to please himself. Praise God that he didn't. Because he honoured and he obeyed the Father so much that he brought us our salvation. He brought us our life. He brought us our forgiveness. He brought us the opportunity to be in God's family. So if we want to know God personally, then we have to listen to the words of Jesus. Go back to John chapter 5 in that passage we read. Jesus said, very truly I tell you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me, has eternal life, and will not be judged, but has crossed over from life to death. Want to receive life? You want to escape God's judgment for your sin? Do you want to escape the loneliness that will be there forever for being outsiders of God's family? Do you want to be welcomed into the family of God and experience the perfect love from the perfect Father through the perfect Son who died for you? Listen to Jesus' words. That it is yours through repentance and faith. It is yours through accepting the cross, turning back to God, and knowing his embrace. Wow. Jesus, the perfect son, and how we related to the perfect father, we should thank him and praise him today. Shouldn't we? Well, what difference does this all make to us? We've been welcomed in by God, but through Jesus, we are transformed. The Bible tells us we're transformed children of God as we grow into the likeness of Christ and grow closer to our Heavenly Father. There's a little phrase that says, we cannot give what we do not have. It's true, isn't it? In all areas of life. But it's true in our spiritual lives as well. We can only pass on the grace of God if we have received it. We can only reflect an image of God if we are being transformed by him. We can only give what we have. And so the influence that we have on others is based on basically where we are right now. The more we receive of God, the more we have to pass on to others. The more we um, gain from him, the more we grow in him, the more we can positively affect those around us. Isn't that a great thing? As God works in our lives, we can also work in others. And so as we become children of God through faith in Christ Jesus, we live out our new life. We become more like God the Father. And so think about some of those other verses that we had read to us just now. Think of Ephesians 5, 1 to 2. It says, Follow God's example, therefore, as dearly loved children, and walk in the way of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. See again, don't we, that God's love was magnificently and beautifully shown to us as Jesus gave his life for us on the cross to bring us back to God. 
And so as we have been made new by him, our response is to do the same, to give up our own lives in sacrifice, in willing sacrifice to God, so that we can live that life not pleasing to ourselves, selfishly, self-centered, all about me, but actually living for God now. We have a greater vision for life. We live a life of love for God and a love for others as well. In his uh, book, Impossible Commands, uh, the author John T. Alcock illustrates how we sometimes think about obeying God by using the picture of a ship. And sometimes when we think about obedience, we, might, we could picture ourselves almost like in the engine room of the ship. In the engine room where it is hot and it is suffocating and it is hard work and there's the, the noise of the pounding of the machinery and we're slogging our guts out and we're obeying God and we're gritting our teeth. That's how we might see it, like being in the engine room of a ship. But what, what the author tells us to do is, what we've got to try and do is maybe walk up onto the deck of the ship. We need to catch a vision for where we're going, the vision of what God has given us in our lives, to breathe in the fresh air of God's grace, to recognize his love, to look to the beauty of Jesus, and to realize that there is a joy in serving. There's a new relationship, there's a new opportunity. Yes, sometimes it feels like hard work. But it's a beautiful thing to obey God, to live in harmony with God through Jesus and to walk in his steps as he leads us through our lives. So just as Jesus was a fragrant offering as he gave his life for us on the cross, so our lives too can be sweet-smelling, an aroma, the aroma of Christ we are as we live it out. That's our, sacrificing, our sacrifice which is pleasing to God and honours him. Think about these words from Matthew that we looked at as well, where Jesus said, you are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. So we know that Jesus said that he is the light of the world, but he also turned to his disciples, his followers, and said, I'm the light of the world, but you're also the light of the world. Because it's through Jesus living in us that we're able to shine. I sometimes um, think about it as um, uh, like if Jesus is living in us, it's like we've got this light in us and we're like, we've got transparent bodies where Jesus is just shining out of us because that's what he does. But what we sometimes do is we try and cover up. We're covering ourselves up because we're a bit ashamed or we're not quite living right and we're, we're, we're a bit embarrassed about being Christians. But Jesus says, you are the light of the world. As, you, as, as I live in you, all you have to do is let the light shine through you. The power is in the light that Jesus is. It's like a, a lamp that's there to light a room up. What's the point of putting it under a bowl? His whole purpose is to shine. We're here to be distinctive, aren't we? To reflect God and show people what our Father is really about. Think about that image of a, of a, of a city on a hill or a town on a hill. I love it because we're on a bit of a hill here. We're, the church building is near the bottom. Um, uh, various of us here live in the community, living up the hill. Sorry if you're not on this map here. I uh, know could extend it to a bit of a wider area as well. But wherever you are, you are a light in that place. And this is what I picture it as. I think about the world which is a dark place. But you think of each of your houses where you live. Think about all the lights being off, but the house where you live lights up. The house where you live lights up. And the house where you live lights up. In your community, in our community, in the community of Paul's Grove, we are lights literally shining for Jesus in our places. Sometimes you might be struggling, you might think, am I really shining? Are people really seeing the difference in me? But as you keep trusting in Jesus, they will know, they will notice that light that's shining in the darkness. And our prayer is that we will be drawn to our Father, whom we're reflecting as Jesus the light shines through us.
Just keep praying about it and asking God to do a special work in our community. Matthew 5, 43, Jesus also said, You've heard it said, Love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your Father in heaven. See it again? The human instinct, of course, is to love those who love you, give them back what you think they deserve, and hate those who hate you. How They don't deserve my love. But Jesus turns this on its head. He extends who is our neighbor to anyone, those who might naturally be seen as friends, and those who seem to persecute us and reject us and belittle us. Loving and blessing our enemies is simply following in the footsteps of our own Father in heaven. (laughs) Romans 5 reminds us that whilst we were enemies of God, Jesus died for us. God didn't die for you because you were his friend. (laughs) Jesus died for you because you were the enemy of God. That's why Jesus had to die in the first place. God made the first move. God extended his love towards you, not because you deserved it, but because you needed it. And so we follow in our Father's footsteps. I don't know if you saw, um, I was fascinated by the interview that Louis Theroux um, had with Stormzy recently. It's still on BBC iPlayer if you want to have a look at it. Um, There's a bit of swearing in it, so be careful. But it's very, very interesting because there are threads through that through that um, interview, which talk about his growing understanding of who God is. This is Stormzy, by the way, not Louis Theroux, um, but we pray for him too. But a growing understanding of God and of faith in Jesus. And he illustrated it through this. I was really fascinated by this. A a few years ago, um, Stormzy, in one of his songs, was really raging about his own father, having left him for for another woman, Uh, abandoned him and his mum and his family. And in that song, he was really raging and uh, criticising his dad. Real hatred, really. And over these last few years, it seems God has done a work in his life so that in a more recent song, he's talking in that song about offering forgiveness to his own father. Because he realised, Storms, he realises that we all need forgiveness. (laughs) We've all got flaws. We've all got things in our lives. None of us are beyond or don't need the grace of God. And so he's thinking and being prepared to offer forgiveness to his own dad. Comes through in his songs, Life Lived in Public. But I thought it was really interesting. Transformation happening in people as they trust in Jesus. So I wonder for you, who do you struggle with? Who are those people that are causing you pain? Or have caused you pain? Maybe something traumatic. Maybe something ongoing. Be easy to curse, wouldn't it? He is to wish harm or something bad for them. But Jesus says, love them. Pray for them. Want God to break in and do something good that might draw them to him. We follow in the footsteps of our Father who loves and loved his enemies by Jesus coming to die. And finally, this one from 1 Peter 1. Therefore, with minds that are alert and fully sober, set your hope on the grace to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed at his coming. As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, be holy because I am holy. Now, if you literally took the words, be holy because I am holy, it's too daunting, isn't it? You might, you might say it's impossible. How can God call me to be holy and to be like him? It seems so far removed because this idea of holiness um, brings the idea of purity and perfection and a loftiness which is way out of reach for us. But remind yourself of these words. In Ephesians 1, the Bible tells us that He chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. Can you see that it was planned long ago for you to come to know Christ and that you are made holy by God because he now sees you as he sees Jesus. 
It's not your work. You can't conjure up holiness from, from somewhere. It's God who makes you holy because of Jesus. In 1 Peter 2, we're told this. You are a chosen people, a royal priesthood. What else? A holy nation. God's special possession that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful life. Can you see it again? This is God's doing. God's the one who calls you out of darkness into light. God's the one who transforms you. God's the one who makes you holy because you've been cleaned up. Your sin has been forgiven. You're new people. And what happens is, as we embrace who we really are, God grows us more and more and more into the people that we are meant to be. We just embrace what we've been given and we want to grow in him. Do you remember last week when Chris was talking about um, God disciplining us? The whole, the whole word discipline is about God's child rearing, it's pediatrics, God's growing us as his children that we might grow and share in his holiness. It's God's work in us to make us more like him. So when we're faced with commands like be holy because I am holy or be perfect therefore as your heavenly Father is perfect, whilst it might daunt us a little bit, one, we have to remember that God is and has and is at work in us doing that thing. But whilst we might, we recognize that we're not going to be perfect in this life, we will be one day. Remember where you're headed Catch the vision of where God is taking you in your life. Don't get caught in a rut. But let's move forward in him. Because when you meet Jesus face to face, the completion of the work that he is doing in you will be magnificent. You will be the very person that you really, really want to be in Christ. And all that remaining sin that you haven't quite shaken off in this life will be stripped away. And so now what we do is that inspires us. Rather than be holy as I am holy, be perfect as I am perfect, uh, daunting us and us thinking we're just going to give up because we can't reach it. No, we say, I'm on the way. God is doing the work in me. So I want more of it now because that's the direction I'm headed in. Lord, give me more. Make me more like you. Inspire me by your spirit. Give me strength for every day that I might walk in your footsteps. Copy my heavenly father and to be more like Jesus. So as we go back to the start of the message where we started, parental influence on their children. Let me take you to Shrek. <laughs> Didn't expect that, did you, is the, is the conclusion. In Shrek the third, Shrek was thinking about parenthood. He was afraid of becoming a father because he thought he'd do a terrible job. Why? Because his own father was really cruel to him when he was growing up. In fact, he recounts a story when he said, my father actually wanted to eat me. He put an apple in my mouth and smothered me in barbecued sauce. But anyway, that's the comedy side of it. But the point was, Shrek thought to himself, with a role model like that, I've got no chance. But what happened through the movie was transformation took place in his life. As he helped various other fairy tale characters to shake off negative perceptions of them by those around them, Shrek started to catch a new vision for his life. And by the end of the film, um, we're left with that feeling and that impression that, that Shrek was really looking forward to fatherhood with, with uh, Princess Fiona and uh, the fact that he could be a good influence on his children. The fact that there was hope and a possibility for him. Why am I giving you this illustration? Well, because of this. We're all on a journey. We're all on a journey. We haven't all started from the same place. We've all had different experiences growing up or throughout our lives. The influences that have been upon us to shape us. But here's the good news. As we come to Christ... As Jesus brings us into the family of God and as God becomes our Father, He transforms us, He makes us whole. And His influence upon us means that we can more image Him and grow and grow to become more the people that He wants us to be. And so what does that mean? It's good news for you, it's good news for me. 
but it's also good news for us because then we can be a better influence on our children, on our church, on those around us, in our communities and in our families. Because like father, like son, or like children, as we copy our Heavenly Father, we know the joy of walking with Him. So let's pray. We thank you, Father, that you are a good, good Father. We thank you that we are your loved children. And we thank you that <clears throat> you have made us holy and that you're wanting us to grow into our holiness. Help us if we haven't yet accepted the grace of Jesus to, to come to Jesus today and to become an insider. Help us if we are children of God to grow in you and to walk with you and to become more joy-filled in our obedience as we copy you in our lives. We thank you and praise you. In Jesus' name, amen.